Welcome to the podcast. We're so glad you joined us today. And this is super important um, topic. It is. And it is actually a fundamental topic. It is at the foundation of all that we as parents want to do for our kids. And I think it's a, a fundamental <laughs> example of uh, synergy. You know, synergy, what do you, synergy what do you mean between by that? spouses. What, what, do you, what do you mean? What do you mean? <laughs> because at the end of the last podcast, I was like, I think we should do a third podcast. And you were like, no, we're not. And I said, yes, we are. And you said, no, we're not. And I think that we both think that we are getting what we thought. <laughs> this is not a technology <laughs> podcast. So that's, that's correct. But we are still covering everything that we wanted that... I wanted to cover I in think the last this is, one. I think this We're topic... morphing it into <laughs> something better between the two of us. So it's very, uh, very, right. so it is very important. It's, right, it's it is showing, vital. it's showing how, you know, it, by being our individual selves and working together, we can come up with a better idea than that either one of us would have come up with on our own. See, synergy. <laughs> That's the definition here. So if your wife ever gets her way... <laughs> And I'm just going to say that I got my way, but you know, whatever. I'll let you believe that. <laughs> no, but, but I do think but that what this, are we talking we, about? We, we're talking about <laughs> training our kids in virtue, about yes. forming the character of our children, right. looking at the enterprise that we have all entered in as parents Yes. and say, where are we going? We what, should be what called is the, the goal? messy what is family the... enterprise. <laughs> <laughs> because it, well, it, it, every, everything that we look at in our world is telling us what we should be doing. That's uh, right. Uh, social media, the media, culture, and, and even in some ways, people in the church or what are telling us what we should do. But at, at the heart of what we're trying to do is help form and shape the character of our children. And now we're not controlling our kids, but we are controlling a lot of what happens to them. And at the, the environment end of the day, they're in. and yeah. at the end of the day, we will be judged on how effective we were at. Our passing vocation. on yeah. this to our kids. Yes, yes. Um, because uh, what we, we talked about in, in previous podcasts, and I just want to keep talking about this, the idea that we want to move from frantic to fruitful, that we want to yeah. have this deep sense that um, our lives are more than about just today. Um, we're not being driven merely by the urgent, but really as as families, we want to be uh, in, vitally focused on what's important. And fruitful is the 2024 word, guys. If That's you right. haven't already picked that up. It's, so. it's, it's coming up in my prayer yeah. as well as in the work that we're doing right. is I think this is what we want. We want, and, and, and by that, um, we mean that you're not just a handing on something to your kids. It's bearing life within them, that, that it's bearing and within fruit you. in them uh. and you. That's right. And that it's fruit that lasts, meaning it goes from one generation to the next. And that mm -hmm. idea of, um, and this is something that actually, I, I just ask for your prayers for us. We, we really feel called to do more. I was going to say, uh, this is kind of getting into the announcements. It's perfect. Yeah. yeah. It, it, to, to, we, we really feel called to do more, to bear more fruit as a, as a work, as an organization. And I'm kind of excited, a little scared, um, but we want to bear more fruit because we, we see the plan uh, for us specifically, but really the, the macro plan, God's plan, is that there is a multi-generational blessing, that, that families are meant to uh, pass on our faith, our values, our deeply held beliefs in such a way that it is enthusiastically and zealously and boldly embraced by the next generation right. so that the next generation gets it as well, so that mm -hmm. we're passing it through the generations. And if that doesn't happen, we are heading to a world of hurt. And we, mm -hmm. I think we're experiencing the fruit of that uh, negative stuff the bad fruit. right now. Mm -hmm. And so the question we have for parents is, um, what kind of fruit are you producing? How are you yielding? Because all of us as Catholics, as Christians, have to look and say, if I am a believer, what's the fruit of my life? What, what is bearing fruit in my life? How do I be more effective at doing that? And as a ministry, as an effort, I just want to invite you to uh, consider supporting us. We are launching into some new areas yes. uh, to focus on really building a multi-generational blessing for families, for, the, for moms and dads to step more fully into their role teaching and forming and shaping their kids 
uh, particularly in the topic we'll be talking about today. Uh, but right in the midst of this, you know, we try to do it twice a year where we have a fundraising appeal uh, to raise money to support the good work that we're trying to do. We have a small team that helps us reach. Uh, we're, we're reaching well over 50,000 families mm -hmm. um, every uh, month. Every month, yeah. And um, we want to grow. We want to expand. And we believe there's more that we can be doing, and that's an exciting prospect for us. But we need your prayers, and we need your support, uh, because this is something I think can have a massive impact and, on the world. And just a reminder that it's just us. Like, our podcast was not launched because we had some big organization behind us pushing us forward. Like, we got where we are today just by word of mouth, by listeners. I mean, you don't really see lots of ads for a messy family project or anything anywhere because it is just families telling families. And so I just want to emphasize to everyone who's listening how important you are That's right. to us. Yeah. And the growth of this ministry mm. is literally because of you yeah. like i'm not just saying that to be nice like it literally is 100 <laughs> percent. without it we couldn't yeah. exist yes exactly and so every donation every month monthly donations are just the backbone yeah. of what we do and we really really need that so if you would consider being 25 dollars a month um donor for our ministry that makes a huge yeah. difference in the amount of courses that we can produce. We're doing on-demand things in the amount of booklets that we can write in freeing us up to reach more people, to create right. more ads, to have more things in parishes. People give us ideas all the time. We have so many ideas. I know, I you know. have no idea. We, we, you have no idea how many ideas we have. We have so many ideas, but we need, we need the funds right. to do that, to get partners to come alongside us to help make that happen. So you are the reason we exist, um, not just to serve you, but also it's just like this yeah, coming it, back it, it and pays, forth. It you pays know? it forward, right? It, so totally. if, if this has been a blessing to you, consider making a tax deductible, right? You get to write it off on your taxes, a tax deductible donation to our ministry, um, every $10, every $25, every $1,000, $10,000, whatever you have right. uh, that you want to see bear fruit, hopefully, uh, yeah. in, in the good work that we're trying to do with our small team. Uh, we'd love to have you join us and and reach you know mm -hmm. hundreds of thousands of families uh because of your support and if you want to know more about what our plans are go to our website messyfamilyproject.org and check it out and you'll be able to see what we're working on what we're doing what's coming and it's it's really exciting i mean yeah. i feel like is this even work just because we love it so I know, much I know, like i love i love families i love moms and dads i love kids you know i and just to be able to serve all of you is just, it's a great joy. Yeah, yeah. And we also have the Play and Pray Challenge uh, that right, you can find that on the Messy Family Project, of, right? Yeah. And so you can find all of that great stuff, free resources for how you can uh, enter into the Play and Pray Challenge, whether you've done it before, want to do it again, uh, want to invite your friends, start it new. Uh, we have tons of ideas for uh, fun date nights, uh, for family fun days, and how to enthrone uh, Jesus uh, as the king of your home, uh, enthrone the sacred heart of Jesus in your home, uh, particularly in the month of June, but really throughout the whole summer, uh, make make your family the most important. Make your marriage, mm -hmm. uh, make the fun in your family, the joy in your home alive and palpable to your kids, mm -hmm. and 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 let everybody know Jesus is the king. I Jesus was just going to say, and June is the month of love. It That's is right. the month of the sacred heart of Jesus. June is dedicated to the intense love of Jesus for each one of us and yeah. that he is the king of our homes. He's the king of our hearts. So let's rededicate and just proudly proclaim Christ is king. Amen. Amen. All righty. All right. So let's jump into today's topic uh, about uh, kind of creating a uh, a culture within your home that is oriented towards yes. the formation of virtue, the formation of character in our kids. So I think that what parents have to realize is that if you haven't realized this already, after your kids, all right, so there's, all right, let me just say this. There's this <laughs> life cycle of a family, right? When your kids are all really little, right. it's crazy. Like we were just visiting a listener and very yes. good friend. They have uh, how many kids? Five kids, yes. five kids under six. And they are amazing parents. They're awesome. Yeah. Their kids are lovely. We had so much fun with them. And Thanks, their Teresa life, and Tommy. <laughs> yes, <laughs> their life is crazy and intense and very real, right? Yeah. So when those kids start growing up and they become into like elementary school, you know, and it's like, okay, maybe not as intense, you know, right. because they can 
they can get themselves dressed, they can make their own food, you know, like they're getting more independent. But then when they enter the teenage years, it can start to get really intense again. Right. Why? Because those kids are getting ready to be launched. That's right. Right? And they're kind of, I always picture those teenagers are like yanking at the chain. They're That's like, right. let me go, let me go, let me go. And the reality is that there is no easy button. No. You can't say, my kids are all little right now. It'll be easier when they get older. You know what? It gets easier for a little bit, but then it kind of gets hard again. That's right. And I think that we look for, oh, if we just go just kind of like when they're really little and you think, oh, just give them give them what they want so they stop screaming. Right. That's like a short-term gain and you're kind of like not, you're ignoring the long-term effect. And I think that we can do that with teenagers too. Like we can say, oh, we're either going to try to be super, super strict with them because it's scary giving our kids freedom. Right. Or we are going to ignore their bad behavior and just let them do whatever they want. Right. Both of those are short-term short term fixes without looking at the long term. And, and that's the job of a parent is to have a view larger than the child. The child sees today. Exactly. The parent exactly. needs to have their eyes, both their feet firmly planted, planted in the present with the reality of where their kid's at, but also have a vision of where we're going. And Oh, can I just give you a perfect example please. of that? So yesterday we were talking with one of our sons who's getting ready for college. Right. And we're talking about working to have a, the importance of saving now for, for college. Right. And and just an example of how, and he said some, he made some comment like, well, you know, I just, I want to, I want to have fun, you know, like this summer, whatever. Right. And I said, look, and this is what I realize that he does not realize. I say, you know what people do? You know what people do who are your age? Yeah. They don't save. They don't save. They take out tons of loans. They take out. $10,000, $15,000, $20,000 of loans every year because they want to have fun. I'm putting air quotes here, have fun during the summer. And so then what happens? They graduate, they're $80,000 in debt. They and marry someone who's at $80,000 in debt. Now you're married with two kids and you both have to work to pay off your loans that's right. because you chose to have fun when you were, and I'm not saying kids shouldn't have fun. I'm not saying that. I, I actually said to him, I'm like, don't you think I have fun? I work 40 hours a week. I mean, you think I have fun. I have fun in the evenings. I have fun on the weekends, you know? So, but just for, to show, to try to draw out, that's just one little example of saying, look, son, I see your future head. That, and I said that what I'm talking about, these are people who are six years older than you. Right. They're not people who are like, oh, long adulthood so far away. <laughs> no, it's not. That's right. It's really not. The choices you make now affect, and that's just financially. Yeah. There's a million Short -term other Short-term pain for long-term gain. Exactly, right. exactly. And of course, living a balanced life, be moderating. I don't want an 18-year-old working 60 hours a week. I'm certainly not saying that. Even though I think when I was a kid, my mom made us probably work that <laughs> night. She's a slave driver. But they're now child labor laws. So. <laughs> yeah. but, but just for him to realize, to me, for me as a parent, to have that larger perspective right. and communicate that to him, not in a way that is like, you have to do this, but just saying, trust me. Right. Trust me. And if we, and if I have a relationship with my child that I have earned that right to speak to his heart, I've earned the right. I've earned a relationship. We have a relationship of trust between us that I can say, I can be that mentor, be yes. that guide yes. to say, have you thought about this? Look, this is what people who are six years older than you graduate from college. This is what they're dealing with. Right. You want to deal with that? Because what we're trying to do is again, for the parents who have young kids, you're really, we've talked about this, you're protecting their innocence. Yeah. But you're slowly beginning um, in the tween years and definitely substantially in the teen years, yes. you're shifting to building Christian maturity. What you're yes. doing is you're moving from, you're controlling uh, the environment and oftentimes their behavior of the little kids of what is expected. Mm -hmm. And you're slowly giving that autonomy and independence rightly and naturally developing in your tween and teen because you want to move the locus of control, right? The, the, the power of their ability to make decisions from kind of external, you, mom and dad, um, to internal, 
in the teen years where they're beginning making their own independent yes. free will virtuous decisions because there is no virtue without freedom. Yes. And so we are we are um, we have to recognize that under our roof is the safest and best and most effective place for them to practice being an adult. Exactly. And exactly. Uh, and if you don't let them practice in your home, then you are just dooming them to failure when they go out into the world. That doesn't right. mean they have full liberty to do whatever they want. By no means. They're still practicing. Again, like the analogy we used mm -hmm. uh, in the technology podcast um, about a, a child learning to drive. The, the state doesn't say, oh, just go throw the keys to your 10 year old. No, right. they have a certain age where it's appropriate and they have the skills and the maturity and the discernment and you know, all mm -hmm. of that moral and, and intellectual capacity. You don't give child things that they are not capable of yet, right? And that doesn't, it's not a fixed date specifically, but you also don't just say, okay, now you're of that age, just do whatever you want. Right. It's they, they work with you. You slowly uh, move them to this place. And that's really what, again, just big picture, that's what we're trying to do, that that short-term pain for a long-term gain, meaning there is going to be more work, right? This is why we get paid the big bucks as parents. We we are going to put in some time right now yeah. to really form not just their behavior, but the heart of our child. Right. That's the really, we have to have that goal in our mind is that we're shaping the heart of our child, which is much more difficult than shaping merely the environment <laughs> or the behavior. Yes, right? and it is. I remember thinking that when um, uh, one of our kids was like a, a tween and thinking to myself, when they were little, I could make them share. I could say, no, you need, you know, when they're eight years old, I can say, no, you, you have to share that. But when they are 13, 14, maybe I can still make them share, but I can't make them be generous. Right. Generous, right, right. Generosity comes from the heart. And I remember, I literally remember thinking that in my mind. Gosh, it's so much harder. How do I help their heart to want to share and to want to be generous and to want to be good? Right. That's a whole other conversation. Right. And I think that sometimes parents choose, quote, the easy route by saying, well, I'm just going to control them as long as I can and I'm not going to worry about shaping their heart and I'm not going to give them freedom because I am so afraid that they're going to make a mistake. Yeah. We have to allow our home to be a safe place for kids to make mistakes because that's what's going to happen when you give them freedom. I was actually just thinking of another example too from yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> um, our son, uh, one of our our sons bought his own car <laughs> yeah. and he's having a problem with the power steering. And um, our other son, our older son, Patrick, is a mechanic, you know, so he was over at Pat's house and Pat said, oh, here, here, try this, replace this part, you know. So my 16 year old comes home and he's literally covered <laughs> with power steering fluid. Yes, that <laughs> he had said, leaked out all. He around. was so frustrated. And he was like, he, Pat said, change this part and I changed this. The power steering fluid got all over me and blah, blah, blah. And it's still not fixed and it's something else, you know. He was so and so frustrated. He was so frustrated. But I, in my, in my heart, I was smiling. Oh, I was smiling. I was so proud of him, first of all. And I said to him, I was like, look, if you can't figure out, if you can't fix it, it's okay. We can, we can call a mechanic and we can, <laughs> not your brother though, because he, he's too <laughs> he's busy to help you. <laughs> he has a job and four little kids, but we can call a mechanic and we can get it fixed. Right. All right. I don't want you to worry about, cause he was like, I need my car. I need yeah. my car he was for anxious work for this. Because he saw only today. Exactly. And <clears throat> he was anxious because he was really being responsible, 100%. you know, because he's like, I have work, I have football, I have, um, you know, school and everything. And we were like, you know what? It's okay. We can help you. See, it is a safe place for a 16 year old who needs his car to be under our roof and to uh, try well, to fix his car because if he can't fix it, we're here as that safety net. But you know what? If he's 25 and he's out on his own and he's living in another state or whatever, and he's trying to fix his car and he can't do it and he doesn't have any money and he doesn't have a place to live and he does have to... That's a, that's a whole other situation. And but I would rather him try to fix it now when he's 16 under our roof so we can be here to help him. Well, not only that, you can see even in, you know, as a 16-year-old that he 
he has instilled, he, his heart has been formed that I am a autonomous, independent individual who is a problem solver, who can go out and figure things out. I have the will within me to figure this out. And that's, I mean, some of it is, is nature and some of it's nurture for sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, so we, I'm not taking credit for, for his great decisions and uh, his life, right? His personality. But too. it's, but it's about giving him that ability, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like even just getting the car itself, right? Giving him the opportunity to say, look, it's I, not giving him the ability. It's giving him the opportunity. He and, has and, the ability within and, him. And by giving him the opportunity to say, right. Hey, I will help you. Right. I will match you with where you're at financially to help get this car because it's incentivizing him to take ownership for it. Right. It's it's moving from us controlling things and us us fixing his problems. And now when you and, and we talked about this before he got the car. I said when you get a car, it's going to break down, there's going to be this that you know uh, all these things they, they happen. Yeah. And so we talked about it but again this is not necessarily um a pristine view of virtue, but there are a lot of human virtues that are coming to bear. The, the discipline to do this, the 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 the, uh, the the thriftiness of saving, right? And mm -hmm. and 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 now not trying to pay a mechanic, but trying to fix it yourself. And we're kind right. of going down a little different path here. But I think that again, the goal is that you're raising kids are proactive, engaged in the world around them, that see their life in their own hands, that right. they, they, they feel like they are in some way a master of their own destiny. And when they hit a problem like this, when they hit a roadblock where their car breaks down and they don't know what to do, you can still be there to guide, them. not solve their problems, not fix it, not write a check and just say, mm -hmm. we'll take care of that. No, you're gonna help them walk through it. And like the first thing I thought of, different but but similar, I was my wheels were turning like, yeah, this is a great lesson. When he walked in with the power steering, yeah. threw it all over himself. I, was, I, I looked at it and I, I, I laughed. I don't think audibly, but I, I, in my heart, I laughed and I thought, I've been there. Yeah. Uh, and um, I saw in his face, he- As a dad, <laughs> you've been there. As a father, as a full grown man, correct. you've been there. And, 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 it's and, tough, and yeah. I, and I looked at him and I said, have you eaten? Have you- you know? Yeah, you did and, and, yeah. and then I said- Because he was so upset. <laughs> and, and I said, let's just take a moment. Take you'll, a breath. You'll, you'll think more clearly after you're, you've kind of given yourself a little space from it. And I said, why don't you just eat something and maybe go take a shower? And he's like, oh, I gotta go take a shower. And, <laughs> and he came down and he was much more peaceful. Yeah. And he could then approach the problem Problem with some clarity because again when you're frustrated when you're mad when you're angry those synapses yeah. fuse together it's hard to think and all you see particularly as a kid is there's no way out we feel that way sometimes as an adult and sometimes we just need somebody else to say hey take a breath yeah and our i guess our point is is that he was in is in that position to learn that lesson because we gave him the opportunity to fail that's right that's we right. gave him the opportunity to to number one buy the car uh, number two, try to fix it himself. That's right. We could have said, we don't want to cause you don't, we don't want you to have challenges, son. So we will get you a better car. We will buy a nicer car. That's not going to break down. That's right. Or, oh, if your car is a problem, dad will fix it. That's right. Or we'll automatically pay for somebody to fix it. No, we had to allow him to struggle. That's right. Allow him to struggle because guess what? Our home is a safe place to struggle. That's right. And you could be there with that look on your face and you could say to him, son, I've been there. Yeah. You know, as opposed to he's living in some other state or something, and maybe he wouldn't automatically turn and, to you. And, and as the as it goes to really perfectly to our first or kind of a, one of our key points here is that yeah. you, as they come into the end of the tween years and definitely in the, the, the teen years, that your role as a parent with them needs to shift. You need to communicate to them that you are always on their side as a mentor, as a guide, as a coach, as a teacher. But, and, and you're always their parent, but that there's a new level uh, uh, of, of authority and a new yes. level where you also step back. So it's a weird, like you're stepping up in your stature, but you're also giving them, you're kind of like delegating more of their life to them in a way. I mean, it's, it sounds funny to say it that way because it's, but in a way you're, you're, you're stepping into that role where you uh, are no longer trying to purely navigate everything in their lives. Like, I want to help you think through this problem. I want you mm -hmm. to see this as not mine, not mom, me and daddy, we're your mom and dad. And we've been down this road and we've got great wisdom. And yes, of course, we're still drawing the boundaries, but Hey, let's think this through together. You're yeah. not alone. No, I am on your side, mm -hmm. but this is your deal. This is your situation. This is your life. And I want you to start taking greater ownership of that. And 
And, yeah. and it begins, I remember for us, we, we've done it in different ways and at different times. But one of the things that I found to be most exciting uh, doing with our kids as they come in the teen years is talking about the future with them. Mm -hmm. You know, when they're early teens, um, things that they're looking forward to, driving, independence, different <laughs> things like that. And and that's great. And they and they, there's, there's something beautiful about that. But you want to draw them even further. And yeah. you want to cast a vision. We kind of referenced this a little bit earlier, but cast a vision for your child of what you see them being in the future, that, that you look at them and see your beloved son or daughter yeah, who's yeah. going to do great and awesome things in the future, right? <laughs> yes, that's that, that, right. They, they, and I remember sitting down with, with the boys and kind of saying, well, how would you define your life? You know, after college and don't, because then we don't have to get stuck into what's their career necessarily because they don't, they don't really have a clear, at least most don't have a clear sense of that. Yeah. But, look at what their gifting is. Yeah, and then just say, what does your life look like? You know, yeah. are you married? Do you have kids? Where do you, where do you blah, blah. and so it's like creating this kind of a, a palpable sense for them of this is where your life's going. Yeah. And I remember talking, using that even as an example of, and I don't get too far down this mm -hmm. one path, but even saying, okay, well, do you see yourself married? What about the pre, you know, just talking about what For your sure, vocational yeah. life look like, right? And, um, and as they talked about- Can you give me the piece of paper? Yeah. And, um, and then when they, when they talk about their, their spouse, you know, like I'm like, oh, what kind of woman is she? You know, yeah. for my sons that I was talking about. And, and then, and then we described and what, they, what they look, I said, how do you become the man who earns a woman like that? Who, I love who that. Deserves I love that. A woman um, like that yeah. Right? I, I love that phrase because I think that that is very much, um, I think that casting that vision, especially for teenagers, they can get so caught up in what is right in front That's of them. Right. I mean, all of us can do sure. that, but I think particularly teens can, can do that because, um, who was I? I was talking with somebody on the phone recently about how intense the teenage years are. Yeah. Do you remember that? All of you listeners, do you all, even if you have little kids now, do you remember how intense your teen, because emotions are so intense. Yeah. Like yeah. the highs are higher and the lows are lower. Yeah. Like yeah. I, I remember that so like palpably, like that those feelings of like being in love, you know, and just how like, and just crying and crying over a broken heart, you know, and just like, even just like going to amusement parks and stuff were so much more fun when you were a teen. Yeah. Why? It's because of that gift of those emotions yeah. that are rising up in That's you. Right. And right. so I think because of that, they can get very caught up in what is happening right now. Yes. And there is something so beautiful about that, but we also need to make sure that they also, that you can you as a parent can cast a vision for them and help them to see the decisions you're making today will affect the rest of your life, yeah, you know? Yeah, and that yeah. is, I actually, I was just reading a, um, an article in our local Catholic paper about the, um, the class of men who are becoming priests who are being ordained oh, yeah, this yeah, year. Yeah, like yeah, they yeah. always do a survey. Okay. I haven't, I read There's that like 400 priests in the U S or something like who are being ordained this year. And, and there's a large percentage of them said that they knew their vocation by the time they were 16. Wow. Yeah. It was it was like more than 50%. I can't remember exact percentage. Beautiful. But I was impressed by that. I was like, it was around the age of 16, around then is the first time they thought, I think I would become a priest. You know, yeah. of course, then they, it's, and then it said, but that wasn't like realized for another, you know, for most of them for another 10 years or 12 years, but that was the first time they thought about that. And so- that vision for life, do not underestimate the dreams of your teenagers. And I think that that's part of like, when you were just saying about giving them, um, casting that vision, calling out their giftedness, that's part of that identity and belonging, yeah. right? That we always talk about, that it is so important that within your home, yeah. you are calling out the gold in your children. That they know and who they are. They know who they are. And part of who they are is their giftedness. That's right. And it is what they are to do in the world. And just that, that you see that. And just the fact that you see that gives them that sense of belonging, that rootedness. Yeah. You know, no matter what they do in their life, they are to be rooted within your family as your son, as your daughter. And, and so that's may, so important. And it may seem like a contradiction in some ways because we naturally, uh, their, their whole physical, 
physical and mental and emotional and psychological and spiritual development is oriented more towards an independence that they're growing in, mm. which is vital for their autonomy and their growth and maturity. But during this time, we need to create more tethers to them in grounding them in who they are as part of your family, in your family culture, mm -hmm. as well as their belonging, right? Your family culture does that. Like things like family dinner, right? Mm -hmm. Like e even something as simple as that, um, during, it, it's always important, right? Because it, it's laying some very key um, yeah. impressions and marking your kids with something clear, right? But in those tween and teen years, it reminds them and they will have these seeds deeply planted in their heart that they will know, I am I am a beloved son and daughter mm -hmm. or daughter and that I have gifts that are worth being from right. my parents and even my siblings have recognized that and honor. They have seen that in the way that they interact. You've given them enough exposure to different experiences, even within your own home where they're like, yeah, I, I have some good to do. I have some right. good work that I can do in this world, mm -hmm. uh, which then really propels them on mission, which they're right. not fully ready for yet as teens, right. but they're beginning uh, to look at that. So another, a little, um, tip. I was just talking with a friend yesterday about her teenage daughter because her teenage daughter is uh, starting to date somebody and she's kind of like been seeing like like a good mom she's doing her what she called like her quality control and checking her text messages and stuff and she saw some things that she was like oh I think I need to talk to my daughter about this you know and she was we were talking and she was like I don't know how to how to bring this up with her right and um and I think part of setting yourself up as that trusted guide and mentor yeah. This is the time when sharing your own story is so yes, helpful. So true. So true. Think about, and because, so this, fr this friend of mine, I knew like before she was married, right. she had several serious relationships and one um, guy she was engaged to and she broke off the engagement and you know, she was almost married and then, you know, discerned they broke up and, you know, and she married her, her husband that she has now. And obviously she has a daughter. And, and so her, to her teenage daughter, her teenage daughter doesn't know necessarily the whole story. all of that, That's those right. stories in her past life. But her daughter, I mean, teenagers look at their parents and they're like, yeah, what my you, parents, whatever. What do you know about love and relationships and blah, 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 blah. You know, and I was telling, I was telling my friend, I was like, this is the time yeah. when you say to your daughter, look, I know you see me now as this, you know, 40 something, blah, blah, blah. But I, I said to her, I was like, you need to set yourself up like you're a woman of the world. And, and you know, I, honestly, it's like, um, you know, sweetheart, I know a lot more about men than you think I yeah, do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. here is my story. I, I was in a relationship. I did put myself in these yes. situations. I was with a man that I thought I was going to marry. And I and talking about having good boundaries, you know, and how taking to guard small your steps. heart, right? Exactly. I literally use those words. I yeah. said, and how to guard your heart because you're not married to that guy, you know, you're married to your your husband now. Yeah. But I think that sharing that story is a such a great tactic for teens because first of all, I remember as a kid, I loved hearing stories about my parents' childhood yeah, 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 yeah. and things that they went through. I think it's absolutely fascinating, but it's also a way of teaching that's not condemning. It's it's not saying you never want to give the attitude because think about being a mentor or a coach or a teacher. You don't go to someone and say, you're an idiot. You know nothing. I know everything. So you need to listen to me. Right. And I feel Those are like not the teacher that's, you want to follow. That's not the teacher. <laughs> that's not the coach. That's not the mentor you want to follow. That's not the mentor you want to be. That's right. You know? And so I think that, and that I th feel like for a lot of parents, that's kind of their attitude, especially p good Catholic True. parents who look out into the world and are like, so afraid they kind of in maybe without on purpose, like accidentally are sending that message to their kids. But what you want to do is when you share your story, it's a very, um, it's an inviting thing. Yeah. You're inviting them into the story. You're not necessarily hitting them over the head with it, but you're saying, look, I just want to share you a little bit about where I've been. Right. And, and these are the things that I've learned. And how do you think you're doing you know, because, in regards to some of those, because there you is know? this this pivotal shift in the conversation. 
Um, again, and it's just, we're trying to mentally give you examples so that you, if you haven't already taken this or if you're looking forward, you need to make the shift so that you're seeing that you're trying to now in, get this to be internal for them. Exactly. And the greatest way, it's like you could teach somebody all day long, but you know, like lecture at them. Um, but it often bounces off the wall. I mean, there will be, totally. there'll be plenty that come through, but at the end of the day, Jesus chose to use parables so as to cause, provo provoke within them, exactly. shared a story so as to provoke an emotion or a reaction within the listener so that the, it became their own. And there's, a, I saw myself in that story. Right. Or, and, and when, when we go out and we share some of the mistakes uh, that we've made in parenting yeah. or the failures that we've had and the challenges that we've been through, I, it, it opens up others to, to have the freedom to say, I, I failed too. And they, they have yeah. that level, right? And for us, uh, or I'll just say for me, we, we both have done this in different ways, but like when we look at that golden years of those tween times before they enter the teen years, right. is when we do the growing up weekend, you know, and we won't get into all the details that we've shared that in other podcasts, but part of the reason we do that is to change our um, our perspective on our child to see them in a new light yeah. and for them to see us in a new light. Mm -hmm. I take out like my, our teenage daughters, I take them out. And again, I've talked about this before, but I take them out for that special dinner. I want them to know that they are my beloved, that I, I delight in them, but I also share my story. I share my story of the pain of, of divorce in my family and struggles with alcohol and all these different things, not to scandalize them, but to say, I've been through this and I share some of my dating stories with my daughters and I talked about the importance of guarding their heart. And then I give them a ring with a heart on it, the clatter, Irish clatter ring, to talk about how their heart is, needs to be protected by themselves and me during this time. Right. And so all of that is engineered to create impressions upon your kid, your child. They are now no longer just a child. Mm -hmm. They're on the pathway to becoming an adult and that you are going to view them differently. You're going to see them differently. You're going to treat them differently. And you want them to begin on right. a new level, stepping up to that beautiful place. Okay. So let's go on to the next a little tip here in forming virtue after setting yourself up that mentor, teacher, and guide is you need to expect that they're going to make mistakes. What? <laughs> I thought after casting that vision, they'd be like, so, boom. I know. Wouldn't that be so nice if we could be like, okay, when they're 12, 13, you start doing that. And then your kid will will accept all of your direction on face value and I never mean, do anything wrong ever. Because if they listen to our podcast, they've got it all laid out perfectly. <laughs> Every child will accept so, it. So unfortunately, <laughs> that's not what happens. So we could talk for a long time about the mistakes that we have made along the way. And we, right. we share our mistakes. I we think. share yeah, we, more of them in person because yes, you know, exactly. Exactly. We try vulnerable. to be, you know, yes, exactly. Right. But just remember that there will always be that temptation to control your children. Yes. Rather than giving them um, opportunities for positive formation. In other words, when they make those mistakes, it's very tempting to just clamp down on them as opposed to saying, okay, uh, you stepped outside of line. You, right. you did the wrong thing. You, um, we have this technology policy. We have a, a curfew. We have whatever. And you went over that line. And you have to be very careful, especially as they get older, about how you react to them Going over you the line. You can't have a negative re emotional reaction. You can't be right. dramatic in light right. of their mistakes. I think that is especially true for boys yeah. because teen boys. teen boys want to be seen as a man. Yeah. And if you start treating them like a 12 year old, you are. The it consequences is, are serious. It is a huge. Con and so, all right. I just had, I thought of this example that we shared in our talk when we went to South Bend. So I had a, um, a friend of mine who had a technology policy, this is a dad, and um, he had a technology policy that was like no texting after, you know, whatever, midnight or I don't know what time it was. So he goes and he finds a 17 year old who's like a, it was the summer after his senior year, um, you know, texting his girlfriend. So he, he was blew up at him, went in, took his phone, 
you know, just grabbed his phone and like yelled at him or whatever. And then, so his, his son gets on his computer and he's like texting his friends from his computer. So dad gets, blows up, go downstairs, turns off the internet to the whole house, you know? Yeah. So his son goes to a landline and literally went and called a friend, came in, his friend came and picked him up. And guess what? He never lived at home again. He, they, it went from texting his girlfriend to literally Talk moving out escalation. of the house. Like it totally escalated. Now he's in relationship with his parents. It's not like they never talked again, but he never lived at home again. You know, he, he just like drove, he drove his son out of the house over something like so little. Don't do that. It's not worth it. Right. Like it is so not worth it because then he also lost the opportunity to form his son, not just for that moment, but for years to come, right. you know, because now his son's like, I'm never turning to you. I'm never telling you my mistake. I'm never telling you anything I do wrong right. because you're not going to, you don't respect me. You think I'm a little kid. I'm going to go, I'm going to prove to you. I'm not a little kid. I'm an adult. I'm an adult man and I'm going to do what I darn well, please. Now I'm not saying either. I'm not saying that the son of was course, right. Please don't, please don't get me wrong here. Like, I'm not saying that what he did was right, but we as a parent, we can, we're not responsible for the reaction of our children, okay? What we're responsible for is our own emotions and, and, and our I, own reactions. And I've seen that, and I, I think I've shared this story before, but I had a daughter who had continued to break curfew. Yeah. And I, I realized that the greatest problem I had in my parenting was me. You know, uh, G.K. Chesterton once said, what's, what's wrong with the world? And his, his comment was <laughs> me, yeah. I am. And um, I recognize that, and we all need to know this as parents, that one of the greatest stumbling blocks and obstacles to us being effective is us not dealing with our own junk or our, our lack of emotion or a lack of self-control and, and the poor use of emotions, right? Anyway, I won't go through the whole details, but um, I was livid and I would have definitely burn bridges if I responded with my emotion, with my anger. You were ready to escalate. I was I was ready to go and die on that hill. Right. And what, thanks be to God, I was able to have a briefest of prayer, which gave me a pause, which God then used that pause <laughs> to his greatest effect and got me to merciful say- Merciful Father, <laughs> the merciful Father God and, and, and has it, mercy on you. <laughs> and and I do count most of this, or not most, all of the successes <laughs> in my parenting is because somehow I paused enough in my own will and uh, God intervened. Say, God help me. <laughs> and, and give me wisdom and give me strength. And I knew that I just needed to, at that moment, love my daughter, let her know that she is loved and that she uh, that everything is gonna be okay and there will be consequences. And there will be consequences, <laughs> but we're going to talk about them later. Right. Because I needed space. And Three o'clock in the morning is, is not, not the time, the right time to talk. Right? Because it, I just knew, I knew myself. Yeah. But more importantly, I knew that for the sake of my daughter, I needed to remove those kind of negative emotions. Right. So that I could have clarity. And so yeah, we often talk about channeling the inner state trooper, right? When you're, when you're, when you're, confronted with mistakes. Yes, there are consequences. Yes, there is repercussions, but they don't need your garbage. They don't need your lack of self-control. They don't need you they have enough um, and their haranguing own emotions. them and everything yeah. else because you know what? It's not effective. And yeah. especially if you're a parent who maybe you're becoming more strict or you're, you're trying to set new boundaries or you're trying to get a new level of forming their hearts or minds or what. But if you're starting it when they're 16, 17 years old, I, I of course, it, nothing is ever foregone. Nothing is ever lost. But recognize that the foundation really starts when they're eight, nine, ten years old. Yeah. Where you're planting seeds that you're slowly giving mm -hmm. them more and more autonomy in their life. And you can't come down so harsh, particularly for a 17-year-old who is basically either graduating or ready to graduate. Yeah. We begin to recognize, know your audience, you know, know who you're <laughs> speaking to. Make sure it's... Uh, effectively aligned. That's where, again, we have to have this longer vision for our kids, but have our feet firmly planted in the here and now of where our kid is at. And we're trying to make those connections. All right. So I'm going to, we're going to tell you an, another example um, with one of our kids. And this was, this was a tough one. It was kind of a mistake. They stepped out of line, you know, and just kind of like giving you a positive example. So one of our, so as you all know, like we have four sons. And so in our life, <laughs> I'll just say, you know, one of our four sons over the last, um, over the last couple of years, um, one of his 
friends at school gave him an iPhone, gave him an iPhone. And he uh, came and he came home and we didn't, we didn't know that he had, you know, had this iPhone and, and he was young at the time. And um, so I saw it in his room and I was like, oh, I know this isn't ours. So I took it. And um, so, you know, we sat down with him, the two of us sat down with him and we were like, what is this? And he was like, what, what? And we said, where did, where did you get this? And, and, and he, he, he told us, but he said, um, and I, I said, you know, this is really dangerous yeah, because I, there's no parental controls on this. Um, you could view pornography on this. Right. That's what I, I, I it, it got to a point where it was clear. And then you just asked him, I just asked said, him. have you, cause I, I said, this is like dangerous, right. you know, and this is part, this is obviously outside of our guidelines, like our technology policy, which we have to keep you safe. So this is, this is a dangerous thing. And, and I said, you could see pornography on this. And then you actually asked him directly. And I said, have you seen pornography? And then he just started to cry. And at which point Alicia got up, said, son, I love you. Yeah. And we're here for you and we can get through this together. And then I think, you and then left. I just left because, and one of the things is that in this whole, like expecting mistakes and in realizing when your children, um, fail, basically, right. um, sin, step out of line, you know, whatever you want to call it is that we really want to avoid shaming them right. no matter what it is. Yeah. And I, and pornography is one example, but I think that there's other examples too. And so, and I know that as a mother, and I've talked about this with my other friends who have um, teenage sons. Uh, one of my friends put it, she said to, to teenage boys, their moms are just the most pure, beautiful thing ever. And for them to reveal that deep, dark depravity in their lives, it is almost impossible for them to reveal that to a mother without feeling shame. Yeah. And so I knew that I needed to just know for him to know that I loved him and to let dad, to let a man deal with that, Yeah, you know? And, and so the same, if your child views porn, yeah, it's ideal that the same sex parent, the, the father with the son, the mother with the daughter, there are more. we've dealt with things like this with our daughters as well. More and more um, girls are getting drawn into it. Uh, although the, the preponderance are still uh, with AI, boys. it's like, oh my God, your mind is blown. You know, yeah. there's even less ways yeah. of filtering things. It's and, so dangerous. And so the, the, the average age, we've talked about this before, the average age that a child would see pornography is 12. 41% of kids see porn at school. So even if you have them locked down, yep. there is still the way that it will seep in. Um, as Alicia said, we want to make sure that we avoid shaming them. We, we, we put them in a place where they know that we're on their side as always that that this is a mistake it is not irreparable and it is not irreparable in our relationship um and it's also something that um what i i i did and have, i was gonna say yeah tell tell it, our listeners what you it, did because i know this, this is something people want to know because again just just kind of recognizing that you're now in a sacred place so if your child is able to confess that if there is a sense a, a sense of remorse on their part it really opens up the door and so for, and I, most kids are if you if you're not attacking them, I feel like there is a natural remorsefulness because they know it's wrong. Right, right. And so again, and that's where, and not that I, I wish uh, that any child would ever see pornography, but if it's, if it is, let it be that you find out and that you are there and your heart is ready because yes. uh, we, we talked about this, about the emotion, but it's like, there's a pain inside you when you know what's happened to your child. Your heart breaks. You're like, oh, this wound, this crap, this junk, this garbage. And my first response to him needs to be, I'm sorry. Yeah. No matter how it came to be, even though this was him pursuing things outside of our boundaries and, and mm -hmm. so forth, I wanted to say, I'm sorry, because it is my job as a dad to protect you. It is my job to keep you safe from this garbage of the world. I would never allow you to walk down a dark alley in the middle of the night by yourself. And that's what the internet is unfiltered in a device that is not part of our, our technology policy in our home. And 
then recognizing that, say, okay, I want to know the depth of this. And so while they're kind of remorseful, while they're in the sacred place, I ask questions so that I know when this happened, how often, and I just get a scope um, of how much they saw, how much they witnessed, what are the results of that? I won't go into greater detail, mm-hmm. but, but knowing dads that- dads need to ask that question. And and, and, it, and that's why it's, it's really important. Again, um, you know, another parent could do it, but I think again, like you said, that the whole shame aspect. I just feel um, like it has to be a man, you know? Like even if it's not the dad, even if it's an older brother, an uncle, a grandpa, you know, like a safe male adult. Who because, shares your value on what pornography is. Exactly, because I feel like men, pornography and men and women's experience of pornography is very different. Absolutely. And I think for a man to say to a boy, you're not in this alone, like that sense of brotherhood yeah. of like, okay, now you know, like you've eaten the fruit of the tree of good and evil. That's right. Now you know this evil and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lock arms with you, son, and we're doing this together. Right. You and, know? and so- And I don't think a woman and, can say that. No. And, and again, God will fill in the gaps yes. a, 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 that yes. in our lacking, but it, asking those pre, uh, perspe- or, uh, the questions to know the scope um, and this is a, a tip that we use a lot. Um, and this is true in, in this situation or any situation. Always pretend like you know more than you do. And hopefully mm-hmm. you do. Uh, I could always check the browser history and I did. And I confirmed a lot of what he shared with me. And I could see some timestamps and see some things on there, right? Um, but but knowing that then helps us, knowing the, the poison, knowing the wound, knowing the action can help us create a remedy. And the first remedy is forgiveness. The first remedy is our forgiveness and, um, but then it's also getting him to confession and making that yes. speedy and quick and then finding the right confessor who's going to be compassionate, receive him well, and that he knows what he has to say and just get through and it easily. 90% right? of priests, I would say are so like, if they have a young boy coming to them who saw pornography, they're probably in their heart rejoicing that they can bring freedom to yes. this kid because they see so much worse. And, and then uh, after you kind of get that initial forgiveness and you get that um at least on on the books if you will for confession um you need to then be able to say we're going to do this together we're going to lock arms and say that yeah. i am now this was something that i wish i could have stopped for you i right. wish it couldn't have happened but now that it does now that it has happened you and i are going to work on this together right this is not meant to be done by you alone that's right i am going to be um, this is a lifelong da- battle. This is I'm as your dad, right? I'm going to be with you and I'm going right. to be checking in with you. I'm going to mm-hmm. work with you. And then we're going to create a little bit of a plan to yeah. know, okay, this is where the vulnerabilities, these are your near t- occasions of sin. Exactly. And I'm going to help you. And uh, what device wasn't locked down? Let's get that locked down. Right. Okay, what's the times, uh, the hours, the, the this, that, the, yeah. and put it all in perspective so that we can say to our kids, you're not supposed to do this alone right now but right. this is your new burden right and i'll walk with you with it's yours but i'm going to help you with it and it's not your burden to walk to do alone ever because the reality is that even i know my dad and my brothers my dad is over 80 years old you know my brothers are in their 40s you know 40s and 50s and they all still support each other in yeah, that battle. Yeah. Like this is not just for today's son. It's like you, you wish that they didn't have to fight that battle, you yeah, know? Yeah. Some, but, some, some can, if you nip it early, right? Exactly. You, know, you, you can get it and stop it and stamp but it out. You always, you always have to be aware, right? You always right. have to be aware and, and, and men need to band and, together and support each other. And, and I, again, I pray that you do not have to have those conversations, but if you, if you don't want to have them, one, you need to prepare your kids when they're young, like we talked about, right? Just that yeah. they would know what bad pictures are, right? We talked about that, didn't we? Yeah, we got to move on there. Right. But anyway, but, mm-hmm. but having that preparation, but also being prepared in your heart so that if it comes up, if you have some suspicion, if you feel some movement, Go ask, for it. ask the question and yeah. look at their face, know your kids and see their reaction and then walk with them out of this. Again, and this is true in other situations as well, that when they fall, when they make a mistake, no matter look, what it is, yeah. Look at them with great compassion and mercy. Right. And, but then point them 
to the path of virtue, point them to the path of, mm-hmm. of, of a clean living, if you will, virtuous living, and then walk with them on creating new and better habits for their lives. And our last point here is just simply, you have to be willing to risk giving your child freedom. It's And oh. I just want you to know it's not easy. It's not easy. So if you want to let your kids go out, if you want to let your teenager, uh, you give them, you know, a phone and keys and say, okay, we're going to go down to, we're going to go down to vacation and you have to work so you can drive down by yourself, you know, with, with your brother or sister or whoever, and you're going to make that trip by yourself. That's a huge risk. But you know what? Giving your kids that kind of freedom that they have earned your trust to make a nine hour trip, you know, by themselves, do it. I mean, that my dad did that for my brothers when they were teenagers. Our sons are taking a long road trip with friends this summer. Is it a risk? Sure, it's a risk. But you know what? But, but they've I've, earned our trust along the way. We've built them our, up to that. They've right? earned our trust. and But it's like a trust but verify. But also, it's like, could bad things happen? Yes. And guess what? The bad things that can happen, car accidents, breaking down, you know, whatever, that could happen when they're 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 25, it could happen uh, lots of times. But I, we really, studies show again and again that kids, older teenagers, who are given the freedom to take appropriate risks during their time under their parents' That's roof, right. then they learn how they learn better risk assessment. They have less anxiety. They have learned how to um, cooperate with others to avoid risks in the future. So we have to be very careful to give our kids appropriate risks, even stretching that, like to give them those risks, because remember, we are not managing children. We are training for adulthood. We're raising adults. So you are raising your adults. So it's like, you have to allow them to do things where like, like my son going out camping or taking a canoe and going out on the river. Like he yes. lost the phone one time, you know, the, the <laughs> yes, other things, right? All these kid. things could be dangers and scrapes. And but exactly. Again, There's what, an iPhone at the bottom of the Ohio river somewhere. for one of our kids, you know, it's like, yep. It's like, that's going to happen. But guess what? He's never going to lose a phone again in that way. You know, like he better knows. learn these lessons now <laughs> exactly. than have them for a long time. And they're great yes. stories to tell. They're, yes. they're bonding moments. They're yes. memory makers. Right. And so, so use that as a, as a, a, key, a fixed point for you, kind of beginning and ending with the idea yeah. that we, our goal uh, in parenting isn't to control our kids, right. but it is to raise faithful, free, virtuous, right. mature Christian adults, right? So having that as our goal, what are those experiences that are going to give them a real tastes of freedom right. on small levels beginning, but slowly giving them more and more mm-hmm. because we don't want to stifle our kids. Yes, we want to protect right. them from the, the, the garbage of the world, but we want to really instill in them a deep sense that I am not afraid of going out and taking risks. I'm not afraid of exploring. I'm not afraid of the freedom I've been given. I've actually learned self-control, self-mastery, and that freedom equals discipline, or discipline equals freedom. And that freedom then gives me the ability to choose the good, choose the virtuous life, Mm -hmm. choose the happiness that you, every child has a right to. And I just, just to close up this podcast, because we gotta go, but um, by just saying, It is possible, guys. It is. It is is definitely possible to do this. I know sometimes it feels impossible because we sometimes we only hear about the bad stories and all of that. In the world out there today. Yeah. But in thinking about even like technology and just raising kids, having our five adult children and our two boys who are, you know, in their older teenage, you know, junior and senior in high school, um, and just looking at like their relationship with technology, the relationship with risk in general, like their 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 and, their, uh, their life of faith, their life yeah. of virtue as a whole, and just thinking about the mistakes that we've made. I mean, uh, we could go on and on, uh, but we've caught kids drinking, we've caught kids sneaking out, like we've all of these things. Our kids have done stupid things. But you know what? We've all survived yeah, <laughs> so far. Yeah. Not only and survived, they, they have they have they've chosen learned. lives of, of right. virtue, of faith, right. of 
good connection to technology, good boundaries in relationships, yes. all yes. of this yes. is orienting towards the, the right and free and the true and the virtuous. Exactly. And that's what we can do. It is not impossible, regardless of your background, regardless of your yes. incompetencies. As a, It's like if you get a handful of things right, knowing that you approach family life with a deep sense of humility, that you can always learn and grow mm -hmm. and that you need God, but also a deep sense in confidence, not only in your marriage, but that God will help you along right. this journey. Okay, so quick four takeaways. takeaways. First, communicate you're on their side as a mentor, teacher, and guide. Expect mistakes. Know what to do. What are you going to do when your kid makes that mistake? How are you going to react, whether it's porn or sneaking out or drinking or whatever? Know what you're going to do. And then fourth, just be willing to risk giving your kids freedom. And freedom. just know it's not easy, but... It is possible. Yes, yes. So, so let's go ahead and pray. All right. And and again, if you want any more information on this, we have a, a great download on technology. We have a download on discipline. Right. Um, and if you want to find out about the Play and Pray Challenge, or if you'd be willing to generously support this ministry, please visit us at messyfamilyproject.org. And let's pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we invite you into our hearts, our minds, into the homes that um, of all the families that are listening. Lord, that you would stir up in the parents a new desire, a new passion, a new vision for their kids, that they would think beyond today and have a clearer sense of who you are calling their kids to be, the, the character, the quality, um, and the virtues, and the freedom that they want for their children, and give them the courage and the discipline to live it out effectively. Bless us all. Fill in our gaps, Lord. Help us in our messy family lives uh, to be more fruitful families for you. In your name we pray. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. And until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Amen.